okay so today's lecture is going to be in two parts so in part one we are going to be talking about asynchronous methods about national policy gradient and we'll briefly look at the rpo and ppo which are some state-of-the-art algorithms and then we will transition into the next part of the lecture which focuses more on some practical aspects of reinforcement learning so let's first get let's get started with the first part so in the previous lecture what we saw is advantage actor critic which is written down over here where we have the gradient term on the right and its illustration of the policy on the left and we saw how we started off with the sum of rewards and finally we ended up with the advantage function as a critic to get the gradients right so now typically instead of just using one worker from which we are collecting data it is very common to make use of another worker or many more workers so typically what I could do is they, I can have N computers or N CPUs on which I am rolling the policy independently on all of them. But with the constraint that the parameters between these policies are shared. So, you know, we have shared parameters. So each, each agent is, you know, executing a policy in the environment, collecting some data, updating the gradients, and sending it back to a central place, which gets updated. And then that new weights are sent to all the workers or all the agents which are there, right? So now one question we might have is, what's the advantage of N workers, right? So why, why not just have one? Why actually have N? So this is where we ended last time. So I'm wondering if you know anyone has any thoughts into why we why having n workers might be more beneficial than just having a single worker. So I get one comment on the chat which says, you know, more diverse data in the same time. And I think this comment is spot on. So remember what we saw previously, right? We saw how in reinforcement learning, it is very easy for the agent to become stuck in a bad local minima. This is because the agent's policy is responsible for collecting the training data and this data then updates the policy. And one thing that we saw was how we can overcome this problem by maintaining data diversity. So in a similar spirit, right? So when we have N workers, which are collecting data, each worker has a different exploration, which means that overall, there is much more diversity in the data. So it prevents the policy from uh, getting trapped into bad places. And to make the diversity be even more, typically there is an additional penalty which is included in the policy gradients objective, which is to increase the entropy of actions. So with that, we have this modified objective function where the first term on the left is a policy gradient term. And on the right, we have shown in green is a term which is encouraging entropy of actions, right? So in some ways this is increasing the exploration even more, and it will add to even more diversity. So in this particular formulation, you know, this method is called as asynchronous advantage actor critic. Right? Advantage actor critic because we are using, each worker is using A to C as the algorithm, and asynchronous because there are N workers which are asynchronously updating the parameters. And you know, you can go and see how well this A3C agent ends up doing. 
So what I'm showing is some results on Atari games. There's some Beam Rider breakout in Pong. On the Y axis is a score. And on the X axis is the training time. Right? And the comparisons are showing running A3C with different number of workers. So blue is one and yellow is 16. So what you notice over here is that as the number of workers is increasing, the training is becoming faster in wall clock time. However, if we compute the data efficiency, which means that how many interactions the agent needs to take, and this is summed across, so if there are eight agents, I'm going to sum across the total number of interactions across all the agents. So in, in that setup, what you see is that you're not really gaining in data efficiency, but what we are gaining is in wall clock time. So if something is in simulation and you know, then it is very easy to parallelize across workers and gain on wall clock time. And you know, this is one big advantage which some of these asynchronous methods have over methods which do not use multiple workers. So that's all you know, I will cover in asynchronous methods. So I'll take a pause and see if there are any questions on A3C or on the asynchronous part. So I see there are two questions or two comments over here. Yeah, so Dhruv asked the question, you know, will, because all the actors are rolling out the same policy, wouldn't they end up collecting the same data? So there is one more term, which is exploration term, which gets added, right? For example, we considered how we can add random noise, right, to encourage exploration. And in this case, the entropy term is acting as the exploration bonus or the exploration is, is encouraging the agent to explore. So even though you have the same parameters theta from which you're sampling, there's a distribution from which you're sampling. And that is what encourages you, encourages different workers to have different samples, which leads to diversity. Any further questions on this part? No? Okay. Then, you know, let's recap a little bit. So remember, we started off with reinforce, where we were summing up the rewards and using policy gradients with respect to that. You know, then we saw how we can include baselines, and we were using the value function as a baseline. And then we saw how when we include the baseline, we end up with the advantage function. And that is what led to advantage at the critic. And now what we have seen is how we can parallelize this training across a bunch of workers, which led to A3C. So now in all of these methods, you know, one thing that we're doing is we have our objective function, which is sum of rewards, and we are trying to find the policy parameters theta, which maximizes the sum of rewards, right? And the way we have been doing this is to compute the policy gradient. Right? So how does policy you know, gradient computation work? Right? We are at some, we have some value or some current parameter value, say that is theta old. And then we compute the gradient, which is G. And then we update the parameters with help of the gradient where G is the gradient and alpha is my step size or my learning rate. So one question which becomes important is how do we choose this learning rate or the step size? For example, you know, if I move in about the right quantity, I will end up getting to the maxima of the function. But if I move slightly more or slightly less, you know, we wouldn't end up reaching the maxima, right? For example, we could overshoot and end up at theta two new at which the performance is worse than what the performance is at the current parameter, which is theta old. So, you know, this brings upon the question of how do we choose alpha? 
so to you know make this be more concrete so let's consider a simplistic setup where the parameter space is to be so i have two parameters theta one and theta two and this is the policy that i'm trying to learn and let's assume that we are trying we are only considering the class of gaussian policies right where what i mean is i'm sampling my parameters theta from a gaussian distribution so now you know what happens during training is that we are collecting some data so initially i have theta one and then as iterations are happening we go from theta one to theta i right? so in this plot each of these points is showing a value of thetas that we have evaluated right? and if the policy is a gaussian policy there are two things that we need to evaluate right so one is the mean which is easy to evaluate for example the cross over here is showing us the current mean and there's a second thing that we need to evaluate, which is the covariance, right? And it turns out that estimating covariance is actually the hard part. And the hope is that by estimating the mean and the covariance, we can converge to this optimal solution shown as a blue cross. So we want to start or whatever current point or current estimate is, we want to move that to the optimal solution. So, you know, now, Let's look at you know what might happen uh, depending on the choice of the step size of the learning rate. So in this plot on bottom left, what I'm showing in two colors is the old policy and the new policy. Right? So old policy is in light orange and the new policy is in dark orange. And so this is what would happen if my step size is small. Right? Versus if I have a large step size there can be significant changes in what the policy is converging to. So in this case, you know, it is getting far away from some of the data points which we evaluated. And, you know, versus, you know, something in the middle, which is converging much faster than the conservative update on the left, but is also capturing all the data points that we have which is better than you know what might be happening if we take a large step size. So when we are taking a large step size, a two, which means that our update is very aggressive, that typically leads to a problem that my new parameter vector is far away from data. To see this, you know, visually, so suppose you know I start off with my th I have some you know uh, estimate of the mean and the covariance denoted by my dark orange curve over here, and then I let this process uh, continue over multiple iterations. Then eventually, as you see over here on the rightmost plot, that we are going to converge to the right solution, but we're going to converge to it slowly. Versus, you know, if we move very fast, we might end up moving far away from the data points and eventually end up, you know, converging to a solution which is not optimal. Versus what we want is, you know, somewhere in the middle of both of them, right? Neither too slow because it's going to take a lot of time or not too fast because otherwise we might converge to a wrong solution. So the, so the intuition, the one intuition we're going to exploit is the fact that instead of being very aggressive, we are going to be conservative, right? But the whole game is that we don't want to be too conservative, right? So how do we choose the right level of being conservative is what will inspire a set of different uh, on policy or uh, policy gradient algorithms that we're going to look at. Right? So the simplest way of being conservative is to say that, well, if I'm changing my parameters, I should change my parameters by a small amount, which is that I'm constraining how far I move, which is directly choosing a step size. Right? So this is what we do in vanilla policy gradients or even in 
you know, like A two C or A three C that we have discussed until now, that we can just constrain the step size based on this, uh, based on some value that we choose. Right. Now, now, what is the problem with this? The problem is that small changes in theta can often result in large changes in policy. So I can vary, you know, maybe my theta changes by a very small amount, maybe 0.01. So I satisfy this criteria. But because the relationship between how the change in theta affects the policy is unknown, the policy can change in arbitrarily large ways. So the question then becomes is, you know, what can we do to constrain the policy? Right. So in some ways, you know, what we really don't care about is how theta is changing, but what we really care about is how the policy is changing. Right? So instead of defining this constraint at the parameter level, we can go on and define the constraint at the policy level. Right? And because policies are distributions, we actually have you know, some good measures which can tell us the distance between two policies. So one such measure is the KL divergence. So what we can say is instead of putting the constraint at the parameter level, maybe I want to maximize my sum of rewards subject to the constraint that my policies are not changing too fast. So now this is a much more precise notion than constraining the parameters directly, right? Because now I'm constraining how the policy is changing. And if I constrain that, you know, I can guarantee the policy is not changing too fast. But if I only constrain the parameters theta, I really don't have any guarantees on how fast the policy is changing. Does this make sense? Any, any questions at this point? Okay, so let's see where this leads us to. So it turns out that you know directly optimizing this constraint, you know, can be a bit tricky. So there are different ways in which this is done. Right? So one way is to make an approximation of the KL divergence term. And turns out that if delta theta is small, then we can write the KL divergence as uh, as a projection of the parameters theta with respect to a matrix F, right? Where this matrix F is also called as a Fisher information matrix, which is an outer product of the gradients, right? So if, my, if I'm measuring the KL divergence between a distribution P with parameters theta and a distribution P with parameters theta plus delta theta, then my Fisher information matrix is defined with respect to the gradients of log of P. So what this Fisher matrix is encoding is how each parameter influences a distribution, right? So if you look at this equation, it is telling me that if I change a particular parameter, then how much is it going to change the KL divergence, right? So, so the Fisher information matrix essentially helps me bridge the gap between how the change of parameters is going to affect how much the policy is changing. So this uh, approximation led to a class of algorithms which was called as natural policy gradient. Now this was motivated by you know natural gradients which uh, came in you know much earlier, but for all but you know that is that's a historical uh, fact. Right? So you know turns out that if we use the uh, the formulation that we discussed in the previous slide, which is approximating the KL divergence, 
we end up with the following update where F is same as my Fisher information matrix and G is nothing but the policy gradient term that we have. Right? So over here, we have a term called the natural gradient. So intuitively, the way to understand the difference between the gradient and the natural gradient is that you know natural gradient is reweighting each dimension of the gradient with this the inverse of the Fisher information matrix. And what this does is it makes my parameter what what it does is it makes my updates be invariant to scalings of parameters, right? So for example, you know, suppose if I arbitrarily changed my parameters to be, you know, double them, or I made them four times, you know, in, so my gradient computation is not going to get affected by it, right? So it gives me some invariance to how I parameterize my policy. And the first term over here is the step size. So now what does this actually end up doing, right? So we can look at an example. So I'm taking this example from some work by Jan Peters. So we have a two dimensional LQR controller. So what we are showing is parameter theta one on the right and parameter theta two on the y-axis. And each arrow over here is representing the policy gradient, right? So what you notice is that the gradient in this region are very, very small. What this would mean is that if I'm starting anywhere over here, it will be very hard for me to move to the optimum solution shown over here, right? So, but instead, if you were computing the natural gradients, the scaling of the gradients is much better, right? No matter where I start, I will end up converging to my optimal configuration much faster. So we can also take a second example, right? And you know the curves show a similar behavior, right? Over here on the top left, the gradients are very small, which would mean the convergence is going to be really slow versus if I compute the natural gradient, the convergence is much faster. So what this suggests is that instead of taking the gradient, if I do the natural gradient, it increases or it helps me converge much faster. Any questions on natural gradients? Or yeah, any question? I have a question. Yeah. yeah, go on. Yeah, hello. Um, I thought that the, the, the natural gradient was used to to make the the, the theta the, the theta update more invariant. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I thought it was on the question about uh, how fast it converged. What What do you mean? You mean like, like theoretically, can you prove anything about the convergence? Is that what you're asking? My question is first, uh, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but we introduced the natural gradient, but we introduced the constraint, the, the, the KL constraint, by saying that we want to make uh, the, the policy invariant to um, change of parameters. So, 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 the, okay, so I, I think the way we introduced the constraint was to say that if my policy changes too fast, it can move away from the data and converge to a bad or a local minima, right? Or, or a local maxima. Okay. So, so what, what we want to do is to move slowly, right? So one way to move slowly is to constrain the parameters theta themselves, right? And say, I'm going to change theta by very, very small amounts, right? And that is how I'm going to move slowly. But that can lead to an issue. Right. The issue is that for some dimensions in theta, you can move by very large amounts and they would cause very small changes in the policy. And some other dimensions of theta, 
if you move by very small amounts, they can cause a large change in the policy, right? So because the relationship between, you know, each dimension, like what is the scaling in each dimension of how, so, so for example, you know, a distance of one in dimension one can change the policy by 10 and a distance of one in dimension two might only change the policy by, you know, 0.1. So I don't know in each direction by what amount I should be moving. So this is because I don't know this relationship. So now, instead of putting constraints on theta, I can say, well, I'm going to put the constraint on the policy itself. So the policy should not change too fast, right? And if I put that constraint, then naturally what we come to is the KL divergence. Right, so I can say instead of constraining how quickly parameters theta are changing, let me constrain how quickly the KL divergence is changing. Right, and natural gradients are an approximation to the KL divergence. It turns out that they also have another interpretation, which is that uh, that we become scale invariant. Uh, what, what that means is, you know, what I said that if I change my parameter, um, like parameter in one dimension, my policy will change by 10. And if I change the parameter in other dimension, my policy will change by 0.1. Now that will go away, right? If, it, if, if I change my param, if I now compute the natural gradient, and if I, you know, step by a particular amount in the natural gradient direction, then my changes are going to be similar. Does that answer your question, Jules? Yeah, yeah, thank you. It was, it was very clear. Thank you. Okay. Any any more questions? No. Okay. So Okay, so let's see, you know, what you know, so we made an approximation to the KL divergence, right? So now, next, what we're going to see is, well, if we do not approximate the KL divergence the way we did, but we're going to look at some, you know, other ways of optimizing the KL divergence. So before we do that, I'm going to rewrite policy gradients. And the reason for doing this is to be consistent with the formulation that you will see if you read, you know, papers like TRP or TPO. You know, they just use a slightly different convention of writing. So I'm just going to rewrite policy gradients in that form first. Okay. So you know, this is what we had as the policy gradient where epsilon hat is my empirical expectation and a hat is the adva estimated advantage. So now, you know, I can always take this gradient outside. The reason I'm doing this is just to you know, drive home the point that this parameter or this gradient G is actually optimizing the following loss function, right? Because if I take the gradient of this, this is equivalent. Right? So I'm going to call this LPG, which PG stands for policy gradient. So now let's look at this term. And because of the property of the log, I can rewrite this term in the following way. I, I'm just taking the gradient with respect to log. Right? And this gradient is evaluated at my current set of parameters, which is theta old. And, and theta are the parameters that I want to find, you know, after the update. So now, you know, because these two terms are equivalent, what this means is I can rewrite this loss function in the following form, right? Where this log term is replaced by this ratio, right? So this is, you know, what you can think of as the importance sampling loss function. It is just rewriting my policy gradients in a different form. So now, right? So now what we can say is, well, I want to optimize my policy gradient term with the KL divergence constraint. So in the previous uh, 
slides with natural policy gradients, what we saw was we had a step size that we chose, and then we stepped by that step size in the natural gradients direction. But now, instead of using a fixed step size, what we're going to do is to use line search to satisfy the constraint, right? I mean, what is line search? You know, I get my gradient and I shoot at different amounts in the direction of gradient and see for which one of those amounts is this particular constraint satisfied. And this is what, you know, TRP or trust region policy optimization ends up doing. So the critical difference from natural policy gradients is that instead of using a fixed step size, use line search to satisfy the constraint. So now, you know, we can go and look into some, you know, other ways of, you know, putting this constraint. So let's, you know, let's just investigate this con constraint a little bit more. So instead of putting the constraint in the following way, I could also rewrite my objective function and directly try to optimize my, like a joint loss function, which is the policy gradient term plus the constraint term. So now what are the pros and cons of V1, like the version on the top and the version on the bottom? So version on the top, doing SGD is quite non-trivial, right? Why is it? Because I have to impose this constraint. And if I'm doing a line search, that means that, you know, I, for every example in my batch, you know, I'll have to do, I'll have to, you know, search um, till the time I'm satisfying the constraint, right? Versus if I just had the KL divergence turn in my objective function, I can just use SGD as is. So, but then, you know, what I'm going to lose is the guarantee that my KL divergence is actually less than epsilon, right? which is guaranteed if I am willing to do an explicit line search which is going to be computationally be more expensive. So because of you know, this one reason, we're going to, to increase my computational efficiency. I'm going to try to, a, to go to a different formulation where I put the KL divergence term directly in my objective function. So this evaluation was you know, performed in one of the papers and what we'll do is instead of doing line search, we're going to directly optimize using SGD. And the results look as following. Right, so this, the first line over here is showing you know, no clipping or penalty. And the rows over here are showing if I use a fixed scale divergence loss. So these results are on seven environments and from the continuous control benchmark, right? Which is a bunch of environments which have the Acrobat, the cart pole, a cheetah, a walker, and so on and so forth. So this is some, some of what we covered in lecture four. We covered, you know, some of these benchmarks. So what we see is that, you know, having the care divergence constraint is much better than having no such constraint. Right, because my rewards are much higher. Then instead of having a fixed scale, you know, one can also adapt the scale as the training is happening. And sometimes you see some benefit, right? But the benefit is not really that significant as opposed to having a fixed scale uh, divergence, right? It, it helps, you know, sometimes a little bit. Now, now the PPO paper, you know, talks about, you know, both in you know, the fixed scale and the adaptive scale, and they have a discussion in the paper because practically speaking, it is adaptive scale does not help. I'm going to skip, you know, how they adapt it. And if you're interested, you can read the, the PPO paper. 
So, but so what they found was that well, fixed scale and adaptive scale are two ways, but actually what works even better is to do clipping. Now, what do I mean by clipping? So remember what I had is this was the objective I was trying to optimize. Now again, to be consistent with the notation in the paper, right, I'm going to rewrite this term, which is the, the ratio of the actions with my current policy and my old policy as this term RT. Right? And R theta of old is equal to one, which is expected. Right? So now with this modification or this rewriting, you know, my objective function looks as following. Right? So I have my ratio term and I have my advantage function. So now instead of using this clear divergence constraint, what we're going to do is we're going to clip my uh, the product of you know this ratio and the advantage function, right? So if you look at this expectation, it says take the expectation of this term R T A T. Or say there should be a min term over here which is missing. So it's min over this and the clipped version. So what this means is that when I'm clipping, that right, it means that don't let the ratio of my, of the policy or, or the probability of the action from the new policy and from the old policy change too much. Right? Because if this is going to change too much, then I'm going to clip it. Right? So this clipping enforces that my policy that I'm finding is close to my old policy. So instead of doing the KL divergence term to constrain how my policy is changing, we can use this clipping function to modify how my policy is changing. And you know, empirically, you know, as we saw before, what they found is this clipping is working much nicer than using uh, the care divergence term explicitly. And then this, and you know, this is what gave the algorithm, you know, proximal policy optimization, right? So everything else, you know, remains pretty much the same. So you can think of, you know, we wrote down the objective function for H3C, which had the policy gradient term plus the entropy. So the entropy term still says, the only thing which changes is we replace the policy gradient with this clipped term, right? The, implement, the other, other details are, you know, exactly as is. And, you know, then, you know, they found this clipping penalty to work better. And, you know, they had results in which they were comparing across these different environments. So as you see, you know, what they consider is, you know, vanilla policy gradients, which is in yellow. Then they have A to C, which is shown in blue. Then they have TRPO and finally PPO, which is in purple. Right. And what you see is, you know, across these benchmarks, at least in most of them, PPO is outperforming uh, TRPO. So, you know, practically the advantage that PPO gives is that in TRPO, you have to do this line search, which becomes slow versus in PPO, you can't, you don't have to do line search. You can directly optimize the objective function using SGD. And that makes it, you know, much more practical to use, right? And the PPO paper, you know, claimed that, you know, PPO outperforms TRPO. Now that comes with a grain of salt that we are going to look, you know, in a few minutes. But before, you know, we look into that, I will pause and see if there are any questions uh, that people might have. I see one in the chat. So TRPO uses scale divergence and PPO uses clipping. That is true. So I think the, 
the buildup is as following, right? We have our vanilla policy gradients. When we say, well, to choose alpha, we need to be clever. So we will introduce a constraint, which is the KL divergence constraint. And one way to approximate the KL divergence leads to natural policy gradients. But natural policy gradients was using a fixed step size. Then the intuition was, well, the step size doesn't need to be fixed. Maybe I should make the step size be adaptive, which is what led to TRPO. Because because of adaptive step size, uh, the problem is that it becomes slow and cumbersome to implement. So that you know led to PPO. And PPO, when they were doing their empirical evaluation, what they found is the clipping to work better than KL divergence, right? And therefore they said, well, let's use clipping, which has the same effect as the KL divergence term. And this was what was presented in the 2017 paper. All right, thank you. I have also a question. Mm -hmm. uh, could, could you explain again, how do they come up with the idea to, to, to using the clip? Uh, if I understand well, it was just at the beginning to avoid uh, the line search to, to be more practical. And then they realized that it was also more efficient or? It, so they realized that it is leading to better performance. But is it, is it by chance or? So it's an empirical it's, evaluation that they did. Right? Okay. So, see, so, if you, so if you actually go and read the paper, right? What you will see is they say in the paper that, you know, TRPO uses, you know, one objective function, which is to minimize the care divergence. We are going to investigate different ways of constraining how quickly the policy can change. Right, so they did. So what they did was they, instead of doing line search, they directly tried optimizing the KL. You know, they directly tried optimizing this objective function. They evaluated this one. Then they said, well, you know, maybe the KL divergence, that the term beta should not be a constant, but it should be changing. So that is what led to the adaptive scale, and they also tried clipping. Right. And, you know, so they pretty much, they said, I'm going to try three things, clipping, adaptive scale and fixed scale. And the paper is pretty much just evaluating these three things. Okay. Because uh, I see the link between uh, switching from the fixed scale to uh, adaptive scale, but switching from uh, adaptive scale to clipping, I don't really see the link between uh, so, 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 so there's, so there's one link which is at a high level, which is that care divergence is essentially trying to enforce that the policy should change slowly, right? Okay. And you can think of clipping as another way of ensuring the policy is changing slowly. Okay. Right. So I think that is the, you know, like the high level link. Now, is there a one-to-one -one derivation? No, you know, there is okay. not a one-to-one -one derivation. Okay. Thank you. And, you know, now, I mean, we'll just see, you know, in just a few minutes that, you know, it actually it turns out it's unclear if clipping actually buys us anything more than KL divergence. So, but, you know, we'll, we'll come to it in a bit. But, you know, before, you know, I move ahead, you know, I'm just, you know, if there are any questions, any doubts, at a conceptual level of what happened from policy gradients to natural policy gradients to TRPO to PPO, I'm happy to answer them now. Okay, well, it seems like there are no questions. So, you know, so what I covered are these algorithms at a conceptual level so that you get an essence of what is the main idea behind these algorithms. You know, a bit of this we are going to do in, you know, one of the assignments. Now, you know, if you want to get, you know, more in-depth knowledge about TRPO and PPO, I encourage you to read the papers. 
and i hope you know with the background from this lecture reading the paper will be much more easy and you know if you really think you know we should go into more details about you know how the care divergence term or constraint is applied you know feel free to provide you know that in the feedback form and we you know if there is significant interest you know we'll be happy to cover it in more detail but i think we have communicated the core conceptual idea uh, in what goes behind national policy gradient trpo and ppo Okay, so well, if there are no you know questions, I'm going to switch to part two. And you know, in part two, we are going to look at a couple of things. So the first thing we are going to look at is you know how these you know reinforcement learning algorithms are really sensitive to hyperparameters and also the issue of variance uh, and how it practically shows up you know then you know if we have time we are going to go into issues and define the state space how to deal with large action spaces and touch upon the reward design problem but maybe some of the you know the maybe the last two bullet points we'll touch upon the next lecture so let's you know, start with sensitivity to hyperparameters, right? So, you know, the question, you know, which we were ending the last, you know, the first part of this lecture was, you know, does clipping actually outperform doing the KL divergence loss? So just last year, you know, this paper came out of Alexander Madri's lab here at MIT. And what they were comparing is you know trpo versus ppo which is red in the blue which is what you would expect right because the red lines is performing worse in the blue lines this is what the ppo paper claimed but there were many things that the ppo paper also did more so there were a bunch of code level optimizations you know, which were tricks like, how do you normalize the, the reward function? How do you normalize the observations? You know, what choice of uh, like learning or the optimizer do you use? Do you use Adam or do you use something else? So it turns out there were many, many such choices which were also different between the TRPO code base and the PPO code base. So what they did was they constructed PPOM, which is PPO without these code level optimizations, right? So they removed all these extra things and then compared, uh, you know, TRPO against PPOM. And what you see is that TRPO and PPOM are pretty much the same, right? So in some ways, you know, maybe the advantage that PPO was having, right, seemed to be coming from code level optimizations instead of it really coming from the clip versus the KL divergence term. So, you know, as we, you know, talked about, you know, this clipping was a heuristic that you know, seem to work well, but further investigate and, you know, then what happened practically is, you know, people would, you know, take the PPO code and run it, but no one, I think, carefully analyzed in, you know, a couple of years that, you know, was it really the clip objective, which was changing things or some other things, like the way you normalize, which was affecting performance, right? And this 2020 paper is, you know, really questioning if clipping is doing better than just putting a KL divergence constraint. So, yeah, so I think the jury is still out there, right? That, you know, it seems like both of them, KL divergence and clipping do pretty much 
you know, similarly to each other. And in some ways, you know, you'd be a bit disappointed that, you know, why, why is it, you know, that these things were not found earlier, that, you know, these code level optimizations can make a difference. I think a part of it comes from the fact that the field is still evolving. And, you know, why these things are hard to catch is, you know, something we'll look at in, you know, remainder of this lecture. Right? So just to, you know, illustrate that, you know, let's, you know, look at, you know, some practical issues which end up happening when we're evaluating, you know, reinforcement learning algorithms. So what I'm showing you in the first plot is this one environment, which is the half cheetah. And what we're using is three different network architectures, right? So one is 64 plus 64, which is two layers of 64 units each, a slightly bigger network and even a bigger network. So, and this is trained all with PPO. Yeah. And what you find is there is a huge performance gap between different choices of the network. So if you were doing supervised learning, you know, performance obviously changes when you vary the network architecture, but you wouldn't expect such a big difference uh, given that the differences in networks are not significant. So what this shows is that even the current state of the art algorithms are quite sensitive to the choice of network architectures. So these results are a couple of years, you know, old. These are the 2000, you know, 18, 19, you know, that time frame. You know, since then, you know, we have made some progress to, you know, remove some of these issues. But, you know, if you were to implement PPO as we have discussed in the lecture until now, this is what you're going to get, right? I mean small changes in architecture can have a huge performance difference. Similarly, you know, this is showing in DDPG, what I'm varying are just the activation functions. So once we modify the activation functions, they also cause a change in performance. Sorry, I don't seem to have a reference in the slides over here, but I'll repost the slide with a reference. So you can also refer back to the, the paper which was doing this analysis. Then similarly, you know, there's another thing that we can modify, which is the reward scaling. So each line over here is showing the performance with a different reward scale. Now, what do I mean by reward scale? It means that I'm going to multiply my reward by some value, right? So I could multiply it by one e minus four, I could multiply by one, I could multiply by 10, or I can multiply by 100. So it turns out, you know, for this particular environment, you know, if you modify the scale of the reward functions, the performance can change quite a lot. Now, why would that happen intuitively? Right. The reason is that if you change the reward function, you're pretty much changing how big the gradient is. Right. So if the gradient magnitude is changing, it can really, you know, push you back and forth. Uh, and you can go to a bad um, local minima. Right. So no, this is with respect to DDPG, right, where we didn't really have any constraints but the policy should be changing slowly, right? So if you have you know, such algorithms, you know, the scaling in the rewards can really affect performance. So, you know, the point being that, you know, small changes can have a huge difference in performance. And to make things even worse, I think one thing which was noticed is suppose I take the same environment and then I run TRPO five times with five different random seeds and I'm going to plot the result. I'm going to get that. What I get is the orange curve. And what you're seeing over here is some variance in the performance. 
Then I do the same experiment. I run five more seeds and what I end up getting is the blue curve over here with the variance that, you know, with its variance. So the surprising fact or not the surprising, but the fact to note is that the difference between the orange line and the blue line is actually statistically significant. And what that means is that, you know, there could be a paper, you know, which compares their performance with some previous state of the art, and they could get better performance just by luck because they only ran like two seeds or three seeds or five seeds. So this, you know, raised a concern and this really shows that why if you run RL algorithm with one seed and if you get some mean performance that cannot really be trusted, you really need to run a large number of seeds to trust the performance. Right. So if you look at, if you look at the PPO paper, when they were reporting results, they were averaging it across 21 seeds. So what this figure is showing is that even averaging across five seeds is not sufficient. So if you were to, for example, write a reinforcement learning paper and you want it to get accepted at some of the top venues, and if you only ran say three seeds or five seeds, you know, it's, it, it's very plausible that the reviewers are going to ask you to run more seeds because, you know, three to five seeds might not give us enough confidence on the results. And to you know make things even worse, right? If I ran the same algorithm, but across different code bases, one would end up getting different performances, right? So this is showing, you know, even from the same authors, you know, two code bases in red and orange having different performance, and sorry, the red and the blue and the orange having a different performance, which is different from other implementation. Right, this was a TRPO, but similarly in DDPG, you know, depending on the code base, there were differences. Now, you know, some of these differences were because you know one was in PyTorch, so there was intensive flow, so there were small changes, which led to these differences. And you know, other things people were you know still you know having a hard time trying to explain, you know what is causing differences in these code bases, right? So luckily, you know, we're not in 2017, you know, anymore, right? I mean, we have now more stable code bases, which have resolved some of the issues. But what this tells you is that if you're working on your problem, and if you download, you know, a code base, you know, you you know, better make sure that you trust the code base, right? I mean, just run it across a set of standard benchmarks and see if you can actually replicate the state of the art on those benchmarks. Because if you cannot, it means that you might be working with a bad code base to begin with. So it's important to have the right code base. It's, you know, almost critical if you're doing, you know, research and you know some of the good code bases i think we have it in lecture i think four or five you know the lecture on which was discussing about benchmarks so if you go into the slides you know we have some references to what code bases you know we found to work well at uh, at the present right so you know before i move ahead so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at, you know, these many different choices uh, about network architecture, nonlinearity and source and, and network architectures, optimization and so on with respect to PPO and, you know, see what the recommendations are in what hyperparameter choices should we be using. But before, you know, we go into that, I'll take a pause and see if there are any questions people might have. So I do see one question coming from Siddharth, you know, how many seeds is generally recommended 
So yes, I think you know some papers. I mean, papers still get in with you know three to five seeds, but I think that should make you wary about the paper at at least. So what you know, I typically recommend is you know once you are running your experiments, you know maybe do you know five seeds because doing more becomes problematic. But once you have to report in the paper, you know maybe do ten or twelve seeds. You know when you actually have to report your curves. Uh, in the final version of your paper. But, you know, unfortunately, there is no clear consensus on this at this point. So I'm getting, you know, more questions about, you know, is there a way to choose an architecture? I think we'll, we'll come to it. But you know, any questions on the the previous part? No. So I think you know this is a situation of a glass half full of water, right? So in some ways, you know, you could be you know, optimistic that, you know, these algorithms work and that they have, you know, achieved good results on a bunch of benchmarks and even exceeded human performance. On the other side, you might be very sad that these algorithms are very sensitive to the hyperparameters. So it's really unclear, you know, how to use these algorithms for your own task or how to, you know, innovate further. But I mean, I guess the good news is that, you know, there's a lot to be done. To, so there is, you know, some hope that reinforcement learning algorithms can solve, you know, really challenging tasks from high dimensional state spaces. And there's enough work to be done or a lot of work to be done to analyze, you know, why are they unstable, to make them more stable, to improve upon them. Right. So you can think of you know, a large part, or maybe as you know, maybe like you know, five to six lectures of what we'll be discussing is you know different ways which can help reinforcement learning, right? I mean, maybe by making use of demonstrations, by learning models, and you know, doing things like domain randomization. You know, how can we leverage large amounts of data, which may not be available in the real world, but, you know, maybe in simulation and how we could, you know, by training in simulation, then transfer to the real world. So we will, you know, look at multiple ways in which some of these issues can be resolved by modifying reinforcement learning with some more supervision. And obviously, there is another line of work, which is how do we look at algorithms themselves and try to improve them, right? So that would be, you know, for example, starting with policy gradients, then realizing that causality can reduce variance, then realizing that baselines can reduce variance, right? And then, you know, building up in that particular way or with the choice of, you know, parameter alpha, which was the learning rate, you know, how do we choose it? And, you know, that led from policy gradients to, you know, TRPO and PPO. So the good news is that TRPO and PPO are actually much better than doing reinforce or just doing policy gradients without them. But, you know, maybe the difference between TRPO and PPO is not that significant in itself. Right. So, you know, with that prelude, um, let's look at, you know, what actually matters in on policy reinforcement learning. So it's an excellent paper by, you know, Andy Chovitz. It came out last year and they did, you know, large scale experiments analyzing what is the best on policy RL algorithm and you know, what are different design choices which are critical? 
So there's a disclaimer, you know, all these evaluations are done on these control tasks, which do not require high dimensional observations coming, for example, images, right? I mean, these, the dimensionality over there is, you know, still not super low. It's like, you know, some tens to 30 dimensions, but not like, you know, having a hundred cross hundred image. So, you know, that's a grain of salt that you should take all of these results with, but I still think there are some useful insights to be gathered from this work. So one thing, you know, that you see across the board is that PPO is doing much better than, which is in orange, is doing much better than, you know, this light blue, which is policy gradients, right? And PPO in general is doing better than most other variants of on policy RL algorithms, right? So if you were to blindly, you know, pick up an on policy RL algorithm, you know, PPO is a safe bet to pick up. So the concrete recommendation is, you know, use the PPO policy loss, you know, start with the clipping threshold of 0.25, but it's a hyperparameter that you can vary and see how it affects performance. Right. So a second question you can ask is, you know, should I have the same network to represent value and policy? For example, you know, I can have my state coming as input, I can have some layers which process my state and then I can have two heads, one a policy head and one a value head, right? And, you know, on the left, what I'm showing is the performance, which is for dark blue is separate networks and light blue is shared networks, right? So it's pretty clear that separate networks is leading to better performance. On the right, I'm showing the same thing, but in a slightly different way. So instead of plotting performance, what we are plotting over here is that if I just take, if I ran say hundred experiments, if I just pick the top five experiments, then in those top five, how many of those had separate networks and how many of them had shared networks? This is showing the fraction of you know, the top 5% performing setting of hyperparameters, you know, what is the ratio of separate and shared networks, right? So this is a different way of looking at the same thing, right? And so the concrete recommendation is, you know, you should be using separate networks for the value function and the policy network. Right? So similarly, a question comes up is, you know, how big should my neural network be? Now, you know, if you look at these different tasks, right, so all of these are uh, feed forward networks. And what we are varying is the width of each layer. And turns out that, you know, there is no clear consensus on what is the optimal network size. Right. In some ways, you know, depends on the task. And the sad thing is, you know, maybe something which works, you know, very bad or not, I mean, it's worst for Hopper ends up being the best for humanoid. Right. So the takeaway, I mean, there is no clear consensus on what is the right neural network. Right now, the neural network architecture does affect performance and you will probably have to tweak the architecture for your task. Now, a second question, you know, you can ask is, what is the activation function that we should be using? So, you know, you can look at these plots and I'm going to concentrate more on the, the plots on the right, which were showing the fraction in which different activation functions end up being the best. So you can see tan h ends up being a very good activation function and relu actually is much worse than tan h. Right, so that, so if you are, you know, working with, you know, load, you're working with the state space, 
which is not, you know, say vision inputs and so on, then using the Tanish nonlinearity is, you know, it's the first thing to start with and it's probably going to work the best. Right. And the other question you can ask is, well, I have set up my architecture, you know, I chose a number of layers, you know, there's something on the activation function, but now I'm going, I need to initialize my neural network. So how important is the initialization? You know, so I think, you know, it's pretty clear looking at these curves that initialization is important. Right? And the concrete recommendation is, you know, initialize the actions to be close to zero and have a, a small standard deviation. Right? And that, you know, pretty much works quite well. Right? So which, you know, corresponds, you know, maybe 0.5 in these, uh, you know, plots over here. Then the other question you can ask is, well, okay, I've initialized my neural network, but what about my observation, right? So suppose my inputs are X and suppose my mean observation is mu and the standard deviation is sigma, then I can normalize my observation in the following way, right? Where I subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. Now you might realize there's a funny number 10 to the power of minus six over here. Now this is for numerical stability, right? For example, if some uh, observation or some feature does not change, then sigma is going to become zero, which is going to create numerical instability. So therefore, whenever you're dividing, you know, these terms are a good practice for numerical stability reasons. Okay. So it turns out that, you know, such normalization is quite important. Right. So if you see the dark blue curves are normalized ones and the light blue are the unnormalized, for, for most environments, it is a significant factor, whether you normalize your observations or not. So, you know, when I said, you know, the difference between PRPO and PPO goes away because of, you know, code level optimizations, this is exactly the kind of things, you know, I was mentioning or I was referring to which is, you know, these choices, right? I mean, do I normalize my observations or not? You know, or how do I normalize it? How do I normalize my reward function? So on and so forth. So, yeah. Now the other question, you know, you can ask is, when I'm doing my advantage estimation, how should I estimate my advantage, right? So remember, we could estimate the advantage directly we could estimate the uh, advantage by using generalized advantage estimation of GAE that we covered, right? There's also n step that you can do. So, so what is n step? n step is if I take the sum for n steps, for example, it's like R1 plus R2 plus Rn, and then I bootstrap from the value function. So it will be gamma to the power n plus one V, of st plus n plus one, right? That was n step, right? So one step is when I do v of st plus one is rt plus gamma times v of st, right? So, and then we saw that generalized advantage estimation does a good trade-off of bias and variance. Right? So it turns out that, you know, using GAE is indeed one of the best ways to estimate the advantage function. And, you know, you should be doing that. You know, similarly, the other factor which becomes important is defining the discount factor, right? So, you know, it turns out that the discount factor's choice depends on the task. You know, that is no such, it's not so surprising because this discount factor really depends on how long horizon or how short horizon your task is. So this does ends up being task specific, right? And this is one of the most important hyperparameters if you know, you're implementing your agent. So something to note. 
and also something to realize that that you know there is no concrete guideline on what discount factor should you, you be using is something that you will have to vary and then figure out right. then you know other question which comes up is you know what is the optimizer that one should be using so the recommendation you know again is to use adam and you know they have some recommendations on some parameters of adam which i mentioned in the bottom so if you're using adam you are pretty much good if you're also using ppo right then you know the other question was about what is the learning rate that i should be using in adam and you know they point out a value which is 0 0.003 which is seems to be a safe default value but note you know i mean these all these things are interdependent for example if you scale a reward in a particular way that's going to affect how you choose your learning rate right because if you make your reward be 10 times then it means that you now need to make a learning rate be 10 times lower you know like in a ballpark way so all these choices are intertwined with each other right so these you know recommendations kind of go together in a bunch right you cannot just you know apply some of them and not apply the other ones or if you are going to change them then you know you should think about you know how things are going to get affected you know for example if you're scaling up the rewards for some reason you know you need to you know have you know have something at back of your mind that is going to change you know maybe if i found some optimal learning rate for a particular reward scaling that learning rate may not work if i change the reward scaling for instance you know then you know there is some you know guidelines on you know how to format training data and how we can you know get you know faster wall clock time now these didn't end up being so significant but you know i would recommend the interested user or the student to go and you know look you know at the paper in more detail so some of these things are now you know have been implemented in the latest and greatest code bases so you you know pretty much don't have to worry about how the training data is formatted but you know if you're doing research in the field you know it makes sense to you know look at it so that you understand what's happening below the hood so similarly i mean just like you know as we saw the different you know improvements or different recommendations that were made for on policy stuff you know rainbow that we saw a couple of lectures before also you know provided how different choices in q learning affect performance right so you know we saw how adding double dqn how adding prioritization how adding dueling was helping and how combining them leads to overall improved performance right so yeah so you know that's what i had on you know choosing hyperparameters in on policy rl and you know what things are you know important when you are doing off policy learning and what choices can help you improve performance so now with that you know i'll take a pause and see if there are any questions that people might have so siddharth you have a question how are the means and standard deviations evaluated so you can evaluate them you know for the batch or you know you could collect some random exploration data and you know use those values to calculate the mean and the standard deviation you know both of them end up working but even if you do batch level if your batch is large enough which typically is the case when you are using ppo uh, you should be fine 
Any questions or any comments? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was wondering in, if, uh, for example, if we are working in, a, in an area where the interpretability is a, a, a prerequisite, um, mm -hmm. why are we still using, uh, why do we want to use a neural network? For example, why uh, would that be possible to use, a, I would say, simple linear regression or simpler model like uh, trees that could be interpretable? To understand what policy, what 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 yeah, to, to understand the, the the model behind the, because I feel it's like a, it's it could be really efficient, but on the other way it could be also black box. So I think the main reason for using neural networks is that you know decision trees or you know linear regression is just not as powerful okay. as neural networks are. Like, so there's some function you will not be able to approximate. And in terms of, uh, maybe I think, it, is there a trade-off between, uh, I would say, for example, if, if I need to be, if I need to be faster, uh, would that be possible? Go on. Yeah, if, if, if I want to be faster, uh, um, or I don't have access to a GPU, would that, be, would that be possible to use a simpler model or neural network is a prerequisite here? So if you don't have access to compute, you know, you could try to use a simpler model, but that might also mean that you may not get as good of performance if you use that model. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. So that's a trade-off. So I think, I, think the, I think the take away, you know, that you should have from this lecture is that we have come to an exciting point in reinforcement learning where things are starting to work. You know, this is analogous to how deep learning was, you know, maybe in 1980s and 1990s, where, you know, people could get things to work to some extent, but large parts of what is important, what is not important was unknown. So I think reinforcement learning is undergoing that transition right now where you know every day you know every month every year our knowledge about what makes rl work and what doesn't make rl work is increasing so if you know if you want to do research in ai and you know you are excited about decision making then reinforcement learning is a great area because there is so much to be done right and you know if you thought that RL is the answer to everything, then you should be disappointed because it is not. You know, there are many things that we have no idea how they work, right? So, you know, with that, I will close the lecture for today. And, you know, and then maybe the next, you know, few lectures, we are going to discuss, you know, different ways and different choices which will help us improve reinforcement learning agents and then also look at you know alternatives to reinforcement learning and how you know we don't have to do one of them but we can combine some of you know for example reinforcement learning and imitation learning together so with that 